Team keep it clean. We pretty much made it. The rookies have already reported for training camp. The veterans will be on the way very, very soon. So we are right here at the finish line. But with the veterans getting ready to show up very soon, there's going to be a lot of competition going on. And in order for us to unlock the vault of possibilities with so much different pieces of competition in the building, I, I couldn't do it alone. I had to bring on some very, very special guests in order to help me figure all of this out. Team Keep It Clean, you are in for a treat. Ain't no jazz what I mean. You too, Team Keep It Clean. You see my boy, he like gotta made it. Gotta made it. Well, that's my homie, ain't that right and graven? Right and graven. So Team Keep It Clean, very, very, very special guests in the building today. I got the host of the vault, Bobby Baltimore, Bobby T, and Sarah E, Sarah Ellison. Uh, before we get into it, cause I know y'all y'all like, I feel honored right now because y'all, I mean, we got, we got Roquan Smith, he got, um, who else we had recently? It was uh, Ian Rappaport, Josina Anderson, Jess Reeve. And, and I know like with those names alone, with y'all having them as guests alone, that's a big list right there. That's a monumental list. And I know I ain't even include everybody that y'all done had on the show. So I appreciate y'all coming on. I appreciate y'all being here. But before we get into everything, let everybody know where they can find y'all, who y'all are, even though they know already. But let everybody know where they can find you and exactly what it is that you all do daily. Sarah, you know what I'm thinking, though, right now, first and foremost, we haven't had one Lamar Jackson on, have we? And no. the host of yeah. Team Keep It Clean has, and he's got a pretty dang good relationship with him. So we got to tip our cap to you as well, Ing, and, and it's great to be back with you. We can be found on pretty much all platforms, in, including YouTube, of course, here. Uh, the Vault, a podcast covering the Baltimore Ravens. We got our audio-only platforms wherever you get your shows. Uh, Sarah is obviously super active on Twitter, at mm -hmm. SG Ellison. <laughs> I'm finally back unbanned ready yes. to roll for the season on, on twitter at bobby baltimore and uh we just we always appreciate you know <clears throat> opportunities to collaborate with you and the other creators in the market so mm -hmm. you know it's great to be back with you it's been about a year since you came on the vault within Ooh. the first like couple weeks since we launched hard yeah. to believe sarah but uh yeah it's, it's great to be back oh y'all done been a year already so happy anniversary that's nice <laughs> man. i like that it so is the first the first day of trading camp that's one year Oh man! Oh, all right. yeah. okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Okay, so this is a special time for you. Okay, I got, I got y'all on like at the perfect time. Then that's nice. I like that. So, um, getting straight into a training camp. You you brought that up, which is literally is here. Is here. The rookies they're reporting. The veterans getting ready to report next week, and the quarterback situation. I just want to go through some of the different positions and whatnot. Some of the different battles that could be at different positions. Now we know who our starting quarterback is. But the backups, that's where there could be a little, a little bit of competition there. But before we get into that, how do y'all feel now, especially after the offseason, after everything that it was and everything that it wasn't, that the Lamar Jackson saga, that's in the past now? Because when we talk about the Ravens nowadays, sometimes looking back, it can feel like that was like so long ago that we were wondering like, all right, what's going to happen with Lamar Jackson? Is there going to be a contract? What's going to happen? What's going to go down? But how are y'all feeling now that that's way back in the past? Uh, for me, I mean, just just covering it, it's it's just this constant shadowing, and and maybe you felt it too. Uh, and when I worked, I'm sure it was that way in the building. When I was there in the building, when there were big things happening, I mean, Ray Rice, I mean, that was mm -hmm. just like a huge. It, it it affects the entire building. So I can promise you that they inside the building are ecstatic <laughs> that they can go in. I'm pretty sure that today was like at a. Um, a tag extension day. I mean, oh, yeah. if, mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't done, that is all. There was probably a good two months, Bobby, where I feel like that was our lead every single day. It was like the mm -hmm. newest, whatever detail anybody could get, they wanted to hear it on, on Lamar Jackson and it. And, and I felt like national media especially really pitted the Ravens and Lamar against each other. And obviously there's some truth to that in that you're obviously negotiating and one person wants so much money and mm -hmm. one person's only, so there is some truth to that, but they made it into such a combative situation, which does just doesn't ring true to who I know the Ravens are or who Lamar is. Neither one of them gets super personal. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you're just, you always hear stuff like, oh, Lamar should be offended or, you know, the Ray- it just got so dramatic Indeed. Yeah. that it just took on a life of its own. And we expected that, but it's still not fun to live through. So the fact that that is completely resolved, he's locked in for the next five years. We can all be on the same team again. <laughs> it, it feels good. <laughs> well, Bobby, how, how you feeling, me. man? Yeah, no, what first comes to mind for me is something you said earlier on in the show. It it feels as if it's been a lifetime ago since everything took place, you know, earlier this offseason. And I think what that brings me back to is is something I was trying to kind of portray throughout the process. And that is because there were so many mixed emotions within the fan base, nationally, mm-hmm. regionally, locally, whatever, about Lamar, about how the team was handling it. I kept mm-hmm. thinking to myself, if they're able to get to the finish line here and they're able to start winning games again this upcoming season, it is going to be a lifetime ago because it's going to be an afterthought, you know? And so now all of a sudden, here we are, months removed, and it kind of does feel like an afterthought. All the conversation is surrounding the new-look offense. How will Todd Munkin and Lamar coexist together within this new offense that he's never run at the pro level before to a certain standpoint? We know rookie... There may have been some similarities under Marty's rookie season, but really you got to go back to his Louisville days under Bobby Petrino from a pro style offense standpoint. So that's what I'm most looking forward to. It's so great to have. I learned so much from Sarah throughout the process on the business side of things. It was very educational throughout March and April. Um, You know, (laughs) the contractual languaging, it was, it was, I was up late every single night, like grinding my gears, trying to figure out, you know, the extent of a non-exclusive tag versus an exclusive tag, the organizational strategy behind it, what Lamar was doing with, you know, unre- you know representing himself. It was mm-hmm. fascinating. And I'm just so glad that it's in the rear view mirror because now we're playing with house money from here on out because this is a team that, that should be on paper, you know, contending for AFC championships as long as Lamar's in the building. That's true. I agree. Now with Lamar, again, that's all settled. So that's a beautiful thing. But... With Lamar Jackson, unfortunately, over these past couple of years, he's missed some significant time. So uh, what that's forced the Ravens to do is look for an adequate backup. Uh, For plenty of years now, uh, it's been Tyler Huntley. But now Tyler Huntley's still in the building, uh, but they also brought in some competition with Josh Johnson. Then, of course, there's a new quarterback rule where you can hold three quarterbacks on the team or on the roster and whatnot. But do you feel... And, and I'll start with you, Bobby. Do you feel like Josh Johnson uh, could be significant competition for one Tyler Huntley? Significant competition is a strong word. I think <clears throat> I could definitely see them going back, you know, back and forth during training camp for that primary, you know, slot behind Lamar as as the primary backup candidate. Um, look, they've you said it. You know, the last couple of years when it's mattered most down the stretch, you know, they haven't had their guy that. Everything revolves around number eight. And so, you know, from an insurance standpoint, mm-hmm. they're going to have to make a decision, you know, based on how many quarterbacks they want to carry and, and what they want on game day. Because, you know, Tyler has has been serviceable, but what they told you this offseason without actually telling it to us is that they feel like they can improve at the backup quarterback position. Right. Mm-hmm. And there were some reports out there, I believe, Jeff Zarebek was all over this. Yeah, the Baker was. Mayfield was a name that they kind of looked in at. Yeah, there were several yeah. other names as well that I'm forgetting right now, but that told us, and we've talked about this in the last couple of weeks because this is definitely, this and left guard, probably going to be the biggest conversations aside from how the new offense is gelling throughout training camp. But they mm-hmm. told us that they think that they can almost upgrade at that position. So uh, I'm not sure how much of a, 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 a you know, threat Josh Johnson will pose to Tyler Huntley, but we know that he's got everything that you could possibly want uh, as a backup quarterback. He's got experience. He's Mm -hmm. got service time. The guy's played everywhere throughout his career, pretty much. Yeah. And, and he's, he's shown even with the Ravens, he's shown that he can come in and win games or at least be competitive. So I I think that in left guard will be the most compelling in a couple weeks from now. Uh, Yeah. I feel you. So stay ready. So you ain't got to get ready. Sarah, how you feeling about the backup QBs? I don't feel good about it. The Ravens are three and seven uh, Mm. over the last two years when Lamar went down to injury. Um, Obviously the best case scenario is for Lamar not to get injured. Mm. Um, I don't uh, listen. 
whoever goes out there, if Lamar goes down, whoever's out there, you know, we're going to ride with them. Um, but I, I had a lot more hope in Tyler Huntley. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that the Ravens are three and seven and each time Lamar has gone down, it's just been a free fall. The first time in 2021, it was a free fall from number one in the AFC to Mm -hmm. out of the playoffs. And then the next year, which was last year, uh, they went from number three to barely making it. And then obviously, and there's, you can blame Greg Roman and (coughs) all the other kind of stuff, but you know, Huntley fumbling the ball, I think, you know, change the dynamic of that game where they event they potentially could have won. So, uh, you know, I love Tyler and he's going into his third year, I believe. So maybe he gets better. Josh Johnson. I mean, the fact that he can't outright, we're talking about maybe it's a competition. I don't know. I wish that the Ravens could have landed somebody else, but I also understand like anybody that's better, they want to go to a situation where they know they have an actual chance to be a starter. Right. So your hands are tied. I mean, it's not just mm-hmm. the Ravens. It's it's everybody. First of all, there's not even 32 starting caliber quarterbacks. So some guys that should be backups will be starting. And then so the backup uh, market isn't great already. So yeah. I don't know that the Ravens could have done much more than they did. Mm-hmm. Um, so all you can do now is hope that either Tyler Huntley takes a big step up or Josh Johnson has like some sort of fountain of youth experience. But I just hope and pray that Lamar does not go down. I feel you on that. Now, um, speaking of going down, going down the field, uh, something that Lamar Jackson likes to do. And in order for him to do that, he has to be throwing to somebody. And a quarterback's best friend, sometimes it's the tight end, but a lot of times it's the wide receiver. And Sarah, I'm going to start with you for this one because we go way back, (laughs) way, way, way back with this subject and we're going to move on to the wide receivers. Now this off season Ravens, they, they shocked me big time. Um, shocked me in a good way because just not, not, not used to this because they went way outside of their box, way outside of their comfort zone with how they have really been addressing wide receiver. Eric DeCosta talked about it. He said they wanted to redo, revamp the wide receiver wrong. When he said that, I was like, Oh, okay. Eric, are you just talking and you really want to do something? But they and the, the first thing they did was sign Nelson Aguilar, and I was like, ah, okay, but I don't know, baby. Look, is, is there gonna be more? Is that it? And I was thinking, hey, that might be it, unless they draft somebody. But they went and signed Odell Beckham Jr. And they didn't just sign Odell Beckham Jr., but they signed him to that one, well, one year because he got the four boy years on the back. But they signed him to that one year, eighteen million dollar deal. And even when those numbers came out, I was thinking, um, okay. It's going to be one of those deals where it's up to $18 million a year, right. but it's probably like a low base salary or something like that with crazy incentives, but it was 15 mil guaranteed. I was like, whoa, I said, like, who are these Ravens? Eric DaCosta, what's up, baby? And then it was the, the three mil in incentives. So the way that they attacked it, and then on top of that, went and drafted Zay Flowers, and especially, you know, I'm biased with South Florida players, but anyway, they drafted Zay Flowers too. I'm like, man, they really like, they're really going in right now. And then they went and signed Laquan Treadwell as well. And they're like, and I mean, that was like a little like a little baby bonus or whatnot. But the, the, the big moves were made. And I was like, whoa, these, these Ravens are really going in. And they still kept Rashad Bateman. They still kept Devin Duvenay. I know there were some people thinking, oh, it's a possibility that Devin Duvenay could be traded. And I'm like, I, I really liked what they did at wide receiver. So, Sarah. How do you feel about not only what they did at wide receiver, but the competition amongst the Ravens wide receivers this year? Yeah, we did a we did an episode <clears throat> where we looked at last year's roster and we said, is the roster is the roster at this position the same, worse, or better? Oh, like and that. then when we got to wide receiver, I said it feels like <laughs> they went from McDonald's to Ruth's Chris. <laughs> you oh, know what okay, I mean? Man. Oh man. Um, now, now, uh, now, Ruth's Chris, there's still stuff above that, right? Like you could get a home, you could get a home <laughs> chef, okay, who's coming and personally making you. So Ruth's Chris felt about right to me because you could still go up. I don't know that they have the the best wide receiver core in the world. Certainly not. Maybe uh, we'll see how everybody kind of pans out. Mm-hmm. Um, so on one end, you feel great about it. I mean, I'm with you. Uh, I had been pounding the table for them to get OBJ last season. Bobby can attest to this, and he thought I was crazy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) People started getting mad. Why is Sarah still covering OBJ? It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. But I was getting mad. (laughs) Yeah, you were. You're like, are we talking about this again? I like that. Take take that victory lap. 
Well, well, but here's the thing, though, is I took a mm -hmm. step back in the offseason. I thought it would, would maybe work out because I knew the Ravens were cheap at wide receiver position. I don't think they're a cheap organization, but they obviously have shown that they don't believe in paying wide receivers. Right. And so I thought that <clears throat> last year would have been the perfect time if he were healthy to get him for like a December and January, and then it wouldn't cost too much. So then when, when the free agency came, I still liked Odell Beckham Jr. as a fit. But I, I did not think they would pay that much money. I'm with you, Ing. I was just like floored that they put in void years. And <laughs> I'm still wondering if they would have done that if Lamar was already under contract. I don't, mm. I don't know. I, 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 they say that they feel like it helped bring Lamar around. Mm -hmm. Both Harbaugh and, and Eric have said that. So I don't know if it was a carrot stick or I don't know if they plan on trying to re-sign him if things go well because – I'm sure they don't want all those void years. So I feel like yeah. in their mind, I think that they do want to re-sign him mm -hmm. um, so that they're not having all that dead money in the future. But anyway, but so every everybody has this like, oh man, if they stay healthy, they're amazing. But then yeah. each guy has a question mark. So mm -hmm. OBJ, can he stay healthy? Rashad Bateman, we know he can be a number one. He can be an ex. Mm -hmm. Can he stay healthy? Zay, yeah. he's got this crazy, uh, I mean, just fluid in his route running he's just mm -hmm. so shifty he can be he can be a game breaker but can his size can will he stay healthy with his size will he translate in year one to the nfl can nelson aguilar i mean he's like the the um off-season kind of cinderella story but we get one of those every year every mm -hmm. single year will that translate into the 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 season so i think though that they've gotten so many guys that if like two of them hit and and maybe two or three don't, that you're okay. Whereas before in the past, it's been like, if Rashad Bateman didn't hit last mm. year, we knew nice they were in yeah. trouble. And mm -hmm. yeah, and he didn't hit and they were in trouble. So yeah. at least this year, they've got a few more hands to play. And all you need is one or two of them to hit. And like with, with Lamar, with the tight end crew that it is, with the running game, then all you need is one or two to hit. But it sure would be nice if, if more than two would hit. So I'm optimistic that while some of them may not pan out, that some of them will and might and will end up being Lamar Jackson's best receiving core today, which mm. isn't hard competition. <laughs> That's true. Bobby, where you at with our wide receivers? <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just looking forward to not seeing Mark Andrews lined up outside in a do or die playoff game in January. You know, like they were that bare bones where Greg Roman felt like that had, and they, you know, they had injuries and whatnot. And, and that, that was the ultimate moment where I said, if they don't make a significant change in their approach, the team building this off season to heck with it, like, what, what are we even doing? And so to both of your points, they've obviously done that. They've spent considerable amounts of money and here they are. They, they have revamped uh, as promised the wide receiver room. I just can't wait to see them have, you know, for the first time in the Lamar era, hopefully balance with a capital B. That's what we've been talking about all throughout this offseason, speculating what Todd Munkin's offense is going to be like. And instead of having to, you know, essentially rely on Mark Andrews for four quarters, and we know his durability is unmatched, but there were times <clears throat> last year, and this is why I think the emergence of Isaiah Likely last year and hopefully in year two as well was, was so important. Mark got banged up. Mm -hmm. Going across the middle as a tight end – Look, you can only you can only bounce tackles for so long. He got <laughs> I would have to think that he probably needed this offseason more so than any player on that team aside from Lamar, just mm. solely based on you know, the war of attrition that that tested him all throughout last year. And he missed a couple games if I'm not mistaken too, which is unlike him. So uh, I just can't wait to see the the multi-dimensional Todd Munkin project that he's embarking on in Baltimore because too often have they been one dimensional and too often have they been predictable throughout the Lamar era? Mm -hmm. None of it's none of which has been Lamar's fault. It's been obviously the game planning, the scheme and the personnel. They now have everything, at least again, on paper. That's kind of the, the, the key words here for the next couple of weeks, for the next couple of months. It's mm -hmm. on paper and, and until it translates, you know, we're going to be speculating, but uh, he's got more than he's ever had before. And I think for whatever reason, they're still sleeping on him nationally. The quarterback rankings, what the Ravens will be, except Ryan Clark. I guess he's he's bullish on him. He, he's loving everything that this, this team could be in 2023. Mm -hmm. But we all know one of the Ravens at their best when they're being overlooked. So let them keep being overlooked.
Oh yeah, definitely. Let them keep being overlooked. Now it's funny you 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 bring up the a word that <clears throat> balance balance when you're talking about the offense. And it's funny if I go back years ago, I had the lovely Sarah Ellison on the channel, and we were talking about the offense, and I brought up that word balance, and she corrected me, and she said, no, 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 not necessarily balance, but harmony, that the offense should have harmony, and right now, I know you all had on Jeff Zrebic a couple weeks ago, and it didn't sound like the Ravens and this particular player had the best harmony right now in this offseason, that being J.K. Dobbins, so let, let's shift to the running back position where there's not necessarily a competition, but how are you all feeling about J.K. Dobbins going into this year? And, and Gus Edwards as well. Go ahead, sir. Um, I think that J.K. Dobbins is going to ball out. I, I think it's pretty clear he's unhappy with this contract. When we had Jeff on, it was like just even he wanted to be – it seemed like he wanted to be paid more than Gus and Justice Hill. Um, which, you know, based on what we think J.K. To do, could do um, – would be reasonable. It's just that he hasn't done that yet. And we can get into like his injury and, you know, maybe that's Harbaugh's fault for even putting him out there, all that kind of stuff or Greg Roman, not using him enough. So I don't think, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe uh, Eric DeCosta will just be like, Hey, I'll throw you a bone and we'll do some sort of re you know, restructure where you get a little bit more or whatever, put in some incentives or whatever. But I think the Ravens could stand pat based off of the running back, market hmm. and i think that jk dobbins will eventually come to the same realization that patrick queen has come to as i think it was pretty clear patrick queen wasn't entirely happy um with the the drafting of trent simpson and, right. and all that kind of stuff and so then when he went up on podium he's like well after you talk to some people he's like you realize this isn't the worst situation to be in." He, he's like i realize they do want me here i realize that i'm in a good situation and he realizes, like, he he can make a lot of money. And I think mm -hmm. with, with a good, healthy season, I mean, there is a yeah. risk that you don't stay healthy. But either way, I think that Patrick Quinn could get paid pretty well. And I think the same mm -hmm. could happen for J.K. Dobbins, obviously, on a smaller scale because of the running back market. So mm -hmm. I think that J.K. Dobbins, his passion is so next level that once the season hits and he's on that field – there's not he can't hold back anything i don't think he can hold back anything i don't know what's going to happen during training camp um maybe he tries to hold in some more which i think is what he did uh during mandatory camp um but in the end i mean you see joe mixon he just takes a four million dollar pay cut mm -hmm. for this year and then another four million next year dalvin cook isn't moving people guys are out there just like looking for jobs and waiting for injuries during training camp to get a job and so yeah. i think eventually mm -hmm. he's going to have to face the reality that you know, I don't think he's being mistreated, not at all. Um, so he's just going to have to face the reality that it's like, hey, Gus had to go through this, but as an undrafted rookie, he was making nothing. Justice mm -hmm. Hill had to go through this, and he went through injuries and wasn't was making – both of them made less than than J.K. did because he was a second rounder. <clears throat> and so mm -hmm. it's just like, I, go, I got to go out there and ball out. And then once you start winning, it's like we said with Lamar. It's like so many times – how many times did people say, oh, well, even if they get a deal done – too much damage has been done. They're not going to love each other. They're not going to like each other. No, that's not how it works. It's not how it works at all. I think that once things start going and, and winning starts going, all of this is going to kind of go to background and background music and JK can totally ball out. I think he, I really, I really do think he's, I really think he's on the way to having a spectacular season and all of this was going to be forgotten about until next off season. All right, sounds good. Looking forward to it. Now, Bobby, you had um you brought up something earlier uh, about some of the competition uh, that the Ravens could have, and especially one of the biggest battles that they could be having, especially since so much is already settled. Uh, that being that left guard spot, um, right now it seems like it is open for grabs, uh, especially after Ben Powers left and signed with the Denver Broncos with that big contract. Who are some candidates that you, who are some candidates you feel could fill in uh, for him at the left guard spot? I think it's important to remember too. Like this time last year, we had no clue <clears throat> who was going to be the starting left guard. You know, like I think <laughs> yeah. the fan favorite, right? The, the, the fan favorite, which, which tells you just how great of a comeback it was for Ben, and then obviously 
he cashed in significantly in, in free mm-hmm. agency, which is a great story, and he's a great guy. But um, you know, this time last year, the fan favorite would have been Ben Cleveland, and then the conditioning test really mm-hmm. gave him you know a, a, a tricky time there to pass that thing. And by the way, it's no joke. Sarah knows this. She was in the building. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's no joke whatsoever. And um, so you know, to me, this could be something that we don't know for you know a good portion of of training camp. That said. You know, Ben, there's not a lot of buzz around Ben Cleveland whatsoever. I think the guy who probably sent his stock through the roof during minicamp was the rookie tackle out of Oregon, Big Sala. You know, the fact Mm. that Harbaugh essentially got up in front of the podium and said that he's got a chance. He's got a chance to be there when it matters. Week one at left guard Mm. is pretty freaking cool because, what, sixth round tackle? He was labeled as a developmental tackle. I'm not going to sit here and say, I mean, gosh, they haven't even had pads on, right? So we're not going to get too ahead of ourselves. Right. But to me, it's probably going to come down to, you know, the, a, a favor to mine would be just because of his, his experience and, and he's a vet is, is John Simpson, you know? But would Sala be sort of the, the remarkable story, the, the underdog, if you will? And then would the surprise at this point be Ben Cleveland because of, how little buzz there is around him. I think it's probably between those three guys. We know that Patrick McCary, based on injuries, based on circumstances, can always be the plug and play guy. Right. Literally, you name the position up and down the offensive line, <laughs> he can do it. And guess what? He has done it over the last couple of years, and that's yeah. why they paid him. So he can always be that stabilizing force for them. But I'd have to think it's probably between you know John Simpson and, and Sala at this point, and you hope that Ben Cleveland can get it, can give it a run because that's what they envisioned for him, and he, he just mm-hmm. hasn't panned out so far in his early career. Yeah, it's going to be see, fun to see how that unfolds. Now, flipping it to the defensive side, because obviously there's no competition at tight end. That's pretty much already set. Um, and at fullback, yeah, no, Patrick Ricard, he got that. I know some people have been thinking maybe Ben Mason, but maybe another year. So um, all the talk at the pass rush position this offseason – We've been hearing so much about David Ajabo, Ajabo this, Ajabo that. And we remember last year, he was probably going to be whether top five, top 10 at the latest, and probably not even that late, but at the latest, he would have been a top 15 pick. But of course, he suffered the injury that set him back. And, and last year was essentially a red shirt year for him, even though he did play in a game and some change. And he did show some flashes in that short amount of time. But this offseason, it's been so much talk about him. And then there's been a little bit of talk about Adafe away as well, but I forget like a forgotten man at the pass rush department, outside linebacker department has been Tyus Bowser. So uh, how are y'all feeling about Tyus Bowser and, and, and the fact that things have, well, at least from what I've heard, it, it, stuff has just been really quiet. So Sarah, I'll start with you with Bowser. Yeah, well, I think it's probably because Tyus Bowser is that kind of... um <clears throat> Sam guy that drops back in coverage a lot. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, you don't think of him as a high sack guy. And I, and I still don't, I mean, he probably could get, uh, I, th- I think he got, I guess I got to look it up. I think he was somewhere around like four or five sacks or something like that. I know he was injured to start out with. So, um, yeah, I just think it's because he, he, he doesn't, he's not like the pin your ears back, go get him kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And so I expect another great year from him. I mean, but but not to the point where I think he's going to get double digit sacks. Yes. Um, I don't I don't I don't know any I don't know that you can predict that anybody is. But I think you think so much about Ojabo is like you said is, is the story, the fact mm-hmm. that when he did get on the field, the in the little time he did that he had came up with that huge sack against the Bengals, and it's like <laughs> oh okay all right what what kind of flash is that there and then. Yeah, so so I just think Bowser does work, some dirty work that isn't completely appreciated, mm. uh, and is it does do some rushing, but does a lot of drop back and all that. So, uh, but I still expect a a um, Tyus Bowser year, which is to just do all that dirty work that kind of goes unnoticed. Mm. It reminds me of Jared Johnson. So, how, how are you yeah. feeling, Bobby, about uh, Tyus Bowser, and really just the pass rush in general heading into this season? Yeah, I just dug up the the PFF numbers just to give us some <clears throat> some perspective here. 2021 was the year of Tyus Bowser. He played in all 17 games, started all 17, and finished with seven sacks. Last year, he played in just nine, started four of those, and had two. Hmm. So 
you know, to Sarah's point, we know what he's capable of. I think what, what you're seeing is, and maybe what, what kind of makes sense about the, the quietness around him is the same thing that's happening with Ronnie Stanley right now. When you're not available, sometimes you can be overlooked or forgotten. Mm-hmm. And so when Ronnie was held out of the ESPN rankings for top 10 offensive tackles and mm-hmm. didn't even be named as an honorable mention, mind you, I think it's just solely based on his unavailability. Mm-hmm. He's just forgotten sometimes. And we all know what he's capable of being. Just look right. at the 2019 season. It was a historic season for all intents and purposes at the left tackle position. And, and we know that he protects Lamar Jackson's blind side better than anybody when healthy. Mm-hmm. So if Tyus can put together a full season, I would expect him to be right around what Sarah was saying, around that five, six sack mark. And that's mm-hmm. great because he's so versatile and, and because right. he can drop back. Uh, I still think that you know there's going to be at some point a late summer move. Perhaps that's the familiar Justin Houston. And you bring him back and see if he can test the fountain of youth again like he did last year. I also saw that one of the outlets, I think it may have been Bleacher Report or ESPN, named uh, Jadavian Clowney as a potential candidate for the Ravens Uh to bring in. He's kind of been a little bit of a journeyman towards the end of his career here, Uh rotating around. Um, But clearly they have to probably bolster that unit with one veteran. It's just a matter of who. And and, and Sarah and I have talked about this in the last couple of weeks. This is essentially David Ajabo's rookie year. You know, I think yes. that's kind of what you were getting at earlier in coming off the red shirt season. Yeah, it this is. This dude was supposed to be a top 10, top 15 pick, like you said. Mm-hmm. And if he can go, if he can come in and be reckless, and if he can come in and boost up his former high school teammate in Adafe Owe ahead of a very pivotal year three for him, mm-hmm. then this is a unit then, I mean, hey, I don't know who's going to be the you know, the, the go-to double digit sack guy, I think Sarah and I maybe feel like there may not be one and they could come in bunches. There Mm -hmm. could be a bunch of dudes somewhere between, you know, that four and seven category. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that's fine. But if there's somebody that I'm thinking that can maybe flirt with that double digit category, it's David. Mm. Okay. And yeah, we're going to see, we're going to see. And now we know it, uh, we're getting sex. It can come from, Anywhere it can come from inside linebacker, it could come from outside linebacker, it can even come from the secondary. And the secondary has been a big, huge topic of conversation this offseason. Because of course, Ravens, they got Marlon Humphrey. We know what Marlon Humphrey can do. Um, but Marcus Peters, he wasn't re-signed, and then they brought in Rock Yassin. But after that, so we, we figured we okay, Ravens got their two outside corners. But who's going to be that slot guy? And, and this is one of the bigger competitions, in my opinion. Who's going to be that slot nickel corner uh, to hold that down? So, Bobby, with the Ravens secondary, who are some guys you feel could possibly fit into that role, whether they're on the team currently or maybe they not might they might not be here yet? Yeah, well, first and foremost, Ian Rappaport told us, you know, point blank that Rock's signing was Marcus's mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. So that's all, but you know, you would think over. Um, I know Sarah is still holding out some hope. And a part of me is too, because he was a heck of a player during his time here when he was healthy. And I think he really galvanized that group. And and you know, there were some seasons where you just think to yourself, what if? Right. I think all of us think, what if from the 2021 season, what if they hadn't gotten decimated? You know, mm-hmm. what if they hadn't trotted out Uber drivers to use something that Ink or Ink Ing Wink said after uh, going off to the Giants? And this was just fresh on our mind because you know this morning's episode was about that that Cincy fan who was trolling Ravens, you know, nation with that that highlight clip from the 2021 season when Burrow <laughs> threw for what a 525 yards, but what yeah. he forgot was that. Yeah, they did have an XFL team that was trotting out there in their secondary. But Mm -hmm. anyway, that's 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 a you know conversation for another time. I think I really feel like the you know CB three, if you will. I I don't think he's on the roster, and Mm -hmm. I think it could be a guy like like Kyle Fuller, who's a late summer signing or a mid training camp signing. Mm -hmm. You know, you forget this guy knows Baltimore well. Uh, He's he's from the Baltimore area. He was sort of last summer's signing that a lot of us thought to ourselves, man, this, this could be a revitalization for Kyle Fuller. And if it weren't for the dang MetLife Stadium turf, mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I think they finally went artificial, by the way, this this offseason, which is exciting for, uh, you know, New York sports fans up there because that that turf took a lot of ankles, took a lot of knees. Yeah. And, and Kyle was one of those. He tore mm -hmm. his ACL in that first game last year um, mm -hmm. uh, against the Jets. So anyway, I think he could be somebody that they're looking at. I know Jeff has been all over that from a reporting standpoint. So that's something to look out for. But I know, you know, we've we've talked about this after Marlin and Rock. And, you know, we're giving some optimism to Rock, assuming that he is going to be the guy starting, you know, opposite Marlon Humphrey. To me, there's a drop off. And when I say there's a drop off, it's just because there's been uncertainty. Jalen Armour Davis is uncertain. I don't know what I don't know what he is at this point in his career. Um, mm -hmm. Brandon Stevens has been very versatile, but I'm not sure what he is at this point in his career. Pepe Williams can be in that same category. There's a group of guys and you have to, of course, add in Caillou Blue Kelly the rookie out of Stanford, they're mm -hmm. really going to be fighting for that third or fourth cornerback slot. And I, honestly, I, I'm, I don't know who that guy is. I'd be flipping a coin. And I know Sarah, you probably agree with that as well. I think that, uh, I think that there's a few options here. So I think one option is somebody steps up, right? So it's, if it's like a Pepe Williams or an Ardarius Washington, somebody shows something during training camp, there's that option. There's the option that say the Ravens do sign somebody and then they either take that nickel spot or they're really good at an outside corner spot. And then you bring in uh, Marlon Humphrey to play inside uh, several times. So there's an option there. Mm. Um, there's the option that I think is being overlooked is Kyle Hamilton. And I know it's because the Ravens are going to put him full-time safety, but I think back to when they were going to sign uh, Adrian Amos or that he had been in the building twice, which is a pretty good indication that they were moving towards the signing. Then last minute he goes up to the Jets because of Chuck Clark. Mm -hmm. So that to me was like, well, if they want to have another safety on the field, Kyle Hamilton can certainly play that nickel role mm. and, and yeah. he's excellent at it. And we saw him play it excellently last year. So mm -hmm. I think they do want to put Kyle Hamilton in, have a majority time be in one spot. But, uh, you know, I was talking to Ken McCusick of film study. He said the Ravens are in nickel, I think like 80, 85% of the time. <laughs> mm. And so Kyle Hamilton can be uh, on the field for a hundred percent of the snaps snaps. And he could be that nickel for 85% of that time and then play, you know, safety if they're in a, um, you know, four defensive back kind of alignment. So I think that there are options. I think if they did bring in another safety, that would maybe mean that Kyle Hamilton does take on a bit of a, that, that nickel role. So I think those are all the options. And with so many of these younger guys injured throughout mandatory camp and OTAs, it was hard to know if somebody like Pepe could step up or, um, or if a, um, yeah, not yet, yeah, not Anthony Avert. Who's the other, um, corner that was drafted with Pepe? Uh, Jalen Armour Davis. Yeah. Jalen Armour Davis. If he somehow got healthy and then he was good on the outside and they trusted him, then maybe you could kick, kick Marlon in. So there's a lot of different options. Um, but I would love to see them pick up one more person because even if you find an option that works and it really works well, mm -hmm. I feel like the Ravens are flirting at this position the same way they flirted with wide receiver last year where like oh, they put all their eggs in the basket with Rashad Bateman and he got injured. Then like, what did the, there was nothing at the wide receiver position. Mm -hmm. And so if you lost Rocky Yassin or you lost Marlon Humphrey, you're in big trouble. And in this, in a year where it feels like the Ravens are all in by paying a ton of money to OBJ and doing some void years that that's uncharacteristic of them, mm -hmm. go ahead and let's not let's not like gamble here. Let's bring in another guy so that if there is an injury and you know there's still other options and that the the cornerback position doesn't fall apart. I like that. Again, stay ready so you ain't got to get ready. Now this uh this episode was really special. This was fun. We got to have the folks from the vault on um, and, and mix them with Team Keep It Clean, so it's always a good time. Now, speaking of the vault, there was a guy, an offensive coordinator, who has been with the Ravens the past couple of years, and I remember one time he said that hey, he had some stuff in the vault that he was ready to pull out, and we saw some of it, a lot of it we didn't, but the Ravens this offseason, they moved on from him. And another thing that he talked about was forging a new identity at one point. But now under Todd Munkin, 
new offensive coordinator, we do expect him to forge a new identity. In closing, how are y'all feeling about the possible direction of this new Baltimore Ravens offense under Todd Munkin? Go ahead, Bobby. I'll just say that um, we're going to have, if everything works out the way that it's supposed to and what we're, we're gathering and learning about, you know, Todd's plan and vision and, and whatnot, we're going to be able to see the evolution of Lamar Jackson as a quarterback in full control. Hmm. Things like processing, diagnostics, um, you know, r reading the defense, being a, a true quarterback. And uh, I, I think what, what Todd said recently, and I think we said this recently on, on our show as well, there are times in this, in this Todd offense where we may see Lamar as the offensive coordinator. Like he's going to have a chance to have complete autonomy. And so I think from, from an anticipation standpoint, to me, it is that. Obviously, it's the relationship between Todd and Lamar and how those two um, can work together. But it's the autonomy and the creative freedom, especially at the line of scrimmage, that Lamar is going to have. He's going to be able to showcase what he's capable of from an IQ standpoint, from a reading standpoint, identifying certain coverages, making adjustments as needed. And, and I, to, to me, now that'll allow you know, that certain portion or maybe this, maybe that certain portion of, of either Ravens nation or the NFL fan base at large that thinks Lamar's not a quarterback. He can't throw outside the numbers. He can't win it when it matters most, you know, all the doubters that have followed him throughout his career. I think he's really going to have a chance to, to, and not that he cares, but he's going to have a chance to silence them once and for all this week, show uh, this week, this year, showing how versatile he's capable of being more so than just what he's been over the course of his five years, which has been pretty dang good, 45 and 16 mm -hmm. as a starting quarterback in Baltimore. And I think, you know, that that to me, bar none, is, is what I'm most looking forward to seeing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so in addition to, like, the effects that I am interested in seeing, you know, what it looks like with Lamar getting more autonomy, but also clearly the thing that the Ravens have, have lacked over the last three years under Greg Roman is a marriage – with, with running and passing. Like it just was like, if you got to the, if you got to the playoffs and they shut down your running game, I, I just don't know that they had the wide receivers. I don't know that they had the scheme. I don't know that they had what it took to actually lean into a passing game in the playoffs. I think we've seen that. Um, I think we've seen that in the regular season. I think Hollywood had a few games in the postseason where he stepped up, but certainly not enough to, to like, hurt a defense and, and strike fear into a defense. So I'm excited. I want to see, I want to see, we've got Lamar Jackson who for sure is probably the best running quarterback in the history of this game. And, you know, I think more than Michael Vick. And so I love that, but why only do that? And, and I think that, you know, he's been stuck in that and, he had an offensive coordinator that could really maximize that, but couldn't maximize anything outside of that. Lamar, mm. it, it, Lamar is, is a good passer too. Perhaps great. We just haven't seen it yet. Uh, we've seen flashes of it and I think he's capable, but we just haven't had an offense that shows that because of a, the scheme and B the lack of wide receivers. And so mm. I'm excited to see, that marriage between the two. And then you had brought up that we had talked about what balance means before. And, and I use the word harmony. Mm -hmm. um, Munkin um, had said that his definition of, of balance is, is utilizing all your weapons. <laughs> and so he's like, if, if one game I use my weapon of Zay flowers and OBJ and Mark Andrews and Rashad Bateman, that's balanced because I got, you know, four different receivers in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't, for him, it's not necessarily, oh, I'm running 50% of the time and I'm passing 50% of the time. It's, right. am I attacking? Do I have a balance of, the, of, of where I'm attacking on the field? Am I only concentrating on the inside? Am I only concentrating outside the numbers? Am I only running up the gut? Like, so for him, his definition of balance is making sure everybody gets involved. Mm -hmm. And so that's easier said than done. Um, but I want to see that. And he has said over a million times 
hey, what's my job? My job is to score points. That's my job. At the end of the day, that's what I'm hired to do. So I want to see if we can get back to that 2019 where it's just like 30 points, 31 points, you know, just always putting it up on, on the board. So uh, in addition to what Bobby said, those are the three things I'll be looking for under Mon Munkin. Yeah, man, it, sh it should be fun. And we are looking forward to seeing exactly how that offense and defense too, the, just the whole team, how they deliver this year. Um, so I appreciate y'all coming on. This was fun talking about the different competitions and training camp and everything that we have to look forward to and just really everything with the Baltimore Ravens in general. So one more time before we get out of here, let everybody know where they can find y'all at and exactly what you do daily. You know, as always, man, we, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you and we're definitely going to run it back on the vault or my personal channel at some point uh, during training camp or, or this upcoming season. So you know, sure. we we love what you do. We we follow what you do. And uh, it's always great to see you in our live streams as well. Uh, you know, you, you always pop in there, get the people going in the live chat, which is appreciated. So, uh, yes, yeah, Sarah and I can be found, you know, wherever you get your shows, basically, whether it's audio only platforms like Spotify or uh, Apple or right here on YouTube. We do daily content. It's Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. Eastern release episodes typically around we just changed our format which you'll appreciate Ing. you know when you start doing things every single day you can get into habits and and sometimes you gotta you gotta switch it up so we just we mm -hmm. just switched our format a little bit we went from scripted to unscripted yeah, so we're now going mm -hmm. 30 minutes monday through friday we have a script in front of us that we follow loosely uh, but instead of reading word for word we are literally going off the cuff we've really enjoyed it we're looking for feedback and we're just kind of tweaking ahead of the season so uh the 25th marks one year so we're, we are going to mm. be celebrating accordingly sarah is coming to maryland we're meeting for the first time since we actually launched this thing nice and if you and carter end up coming to to training camp hit me up because i'd love to have you in the studio we can do something similar here or we can meet out and do whatever so uh, again you know the opportunity is always appreciated by us and and we salute you because you've been doing this for a lot longer than we have and uh, you've definitely made an impact, and, and we're loving everything you do. Appreciate it. So thank you, Sarah. Any closing words before we get out of here? Yeah, I echo what Bobby said. Appreciate you having us on. Uh, you're doing great work. Love that you've been getting Lamar on, uh, working with him and all of that. So appreciate your support. And, you know, Thanks I've said sure. this to lots of people that, you know, I, as we watch, you know, news companies have layoffs, ESPN, mm. The Athletic, we all see mm -hmm. that. And we're... We always Sucks. say, you know, this, it does. And it's, but you know, as well as us, this independent content creator stuff is pretty nice. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. pretty nice. And what I like about it, <clears throat> which isn't always the case, is that it feels like we don't see each other as threats because we all have our own little, uh, our own little vibe mm -hmm. and the way mm -hmm. we come about it. You know what I mean? And we all have our own different opinions and this and that. And so I felt like you kind of lead the way and like, instead of feeling threatened, you welcome everybody with 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 open arms that come onto YouTube. So uh, we appreciate that and your support, and we hope to give it right back to you. Oh yeah, for sure. I appreciate the both of y'all. So team, keep it clean. Uh, I know they they listed a lot of different places where you can find them at. I have all of that down below in the description to make it easy. Uh, their Twitters and all that good stuff, so you can follow them on there. Especially with Bobby, since he's back now, he's back in the building. <laughs> no, no more burner, Bobby, but officially Bobby Baltimore. You back? So. Team Keep It Clean, make sure you subscribe to their channel. Show them love like I know y'all will. Like I know most of y'all probably already do. But on that note, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. And we are out. Yeah, this feels like a dream. And you know just what I mean. You see my boy, he like got to made it. How to made it. Boy, he's a fan and he like the Ravens. Like the Ravens. And you know just what I mean. Team, keep it clean. You see my boy, he like gotta made it.